All right, today we are going to be talking about Nicene Christianity, and uh, this lecture is there on Jewel. Uh, class notes, Nicene Christianity is what it's called. We're coming to a time of major transition now in the history of Christianity within the Roman Empire. And I state it that way, within the Roman Empire, because again, I don't want you to think that Christianity only existed within the boundaries of the Roman Empire. It did not. It existed outside of the boundaries of the Roman Empire as well. Even before Constantine uh, brought peace to Christianity within the Roman world, and before Theodosius the Great made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, we have other nations in the world that have already become Christian. Armenia becomes Christian. Georgia becomes Christian. That's not the state in the U.S., but the country in Europe. And uh, Ethiopia becomes Christian. So we have a number of Christian nations. There's a huge number of Christians as well in the Parthian and Sassanid Empire, which is the former Persian Empire, what today would be modern-day Iran and Iraq. And you have a massive Christian population in that part of the world, which actually experiences great persecution even after the persecution against Roman Christians ends. The reason we spend so much time talking about the history of Christianity within the Roman Empire is because that's the period, or that's the geographical area in which we have the most information about Christianity. And also, our history as Western Christians comes directly out of that history in the Roman Empire, in particular, the Western half of the Roman Empire. But I don't want you to think that the only Christians in the world at this time were within the Roman Empire. That would be an incorrect way to think about this. It becomes important because sometimes skeptics assert that if Constantine had not adopted Christianity, then Christianity would have died, and that is simply not the case. Christianity was flourishing outside of Constantine's realm, even before and after Constantine converted to Christianity. But let's talk a little bit about Constantine. This represents, again, a major transition in the history of the church within the Roman Empire. Up to this point, Christianity has been severely persecuted in the Roman world. Now, this persecution has come in waves. It's not like the persecution was always constant. And yet, as we see in Fox's Book of Martyrs and in other historical sources, Christians have been one of the primary public enemies of the Roman state from 64 AD all the way up to about 305. 305 representing the end of Diocletian's reign. Diocletian's persecution against the church was the most widespread and the most intense of all of the waves of Roman persecution. So Roman persecution starting with Nero in 64 had gradually become increasingly more intense and it climaxes with Diocletian. That, of course, is the time period in which you have the traditors who hand over sacred documents and sometimes even hand over or betray their friends, Christians who deny Christ during a time of persecution in order to avoid death. And then after peace returns to the Roman Empire, they want to be reinstated and restored into the church. Perhaps an appropriate message this morning in chapel when we think about the repentance that they needed to demonstrate in order to be restored to the fellowship. But in any case, the persecution comes to a screeching halt in the Roman Empire when Constantine comes to the throne. Now, Constantine, uh, Constantine's conversion takes place when he is marching with his armies to defeat Maxentius, another rival for the throne. We have, at the end of Diocletian's reign, a struggle for power within the Roman Empire. You have Maximian and Maximian's son, Maxentius, 
and then you have Constantine all struggling for power in the west. There's also some who are struggling for power in the east. And even after Constantine gains control in the west, it'll still be another 13 years or so before he finally defeats the emperor of the east and becomes the sole ruler of the entire Roman world. But it is as he is marching to this battle at the Milvian Bridge that Constantine supposedly, reportedly, sees a vision of either a cross or a Christian symbol of some sort. It's a little bit ambiguous and scholars aren't entirely sure what Constantine's vision consisted of. But Constantine sees a vision of the cross in the sky and hears a voice commanding him to conquer in the name of Christianity and in the sign of the cross. Constantine's armies are outnumbered at this battle and yet he unexpectedly against all odds defeats Maxentius and when he then is fully entrenched as the ruler of the West, Constantine credits his victory to the Christian God. So now we go from the worst persecution the church has ever faced under Diocletian to now an emperor who claims to be a Christian. This represents a massive transition for the church. In 313, Constantine then issues the Edict of Milan, which changes the climate from one of hostile tolerance towards Christianity to one of friendliness and even protection. It's important to state that Constantine did not make Christianity the official religion of Rome. Constantine is the one who provided protection and even promoted Christianity within the Roman Empire, but it would be Theodosius 50 years later who makes it officially the Roman religion. In 324 then, Constantine finally defeats Licinius, who was the one who had emerged victorious in the east, and now Constantine becomes the sole ruler of both the eastern and western halves of the Roman Empire. The very next year, in 325, Constantine holds the first general church council, which we know as the Council of Nicaea. Sometimes people wonder why is it that it took 200 and, what is that, 275 years from the Jerusalem Council? Why did it take so long for there to be another major church council? And I think the answer is primarily due to the fact that because of the persecution that continually existed within the Roman Empire, there was no real means by which all of the church leaders from around the Roman Empire could convene in safety. And now, one year after peace comes to Christianity under Constantine's sole reign, Constantine is able then to organize this church council. The issue, of course, had to do with the nature of the deity of Christ, and we'll talk about that more in just a moment. What was Christianity like under Constantine and then after Constantine? We have the advantage, living in the 21st century, of looking back on what has happened over the last 1700 years since Constantine came to the throne and since the Edict of Milan was passed and, and peace came to Christians within the Roman Empire. We have the advantage of looking at the long-term implications of this, and some of these implications are not good. And we'll talk about those in a little bit, but largely the integration of Roman culture with Christianity led to a lot of problems later in church history. But for the Christians of the 4th century, the early 4th century, Constantine was viewed very much as a deliverer. He was a hero to the Christians, and you can appreciate and understand why. He represented peace and protection for Christians 
who had grown used to persecution and martyrdom. So if the two alternatives are you can be persecuted violently and put to death, or you can receive the protection and even the promotion of the state government, you can understand why the Christians would view Constantine as something of a hero. Constantine attributed his victory at the Milvian Bridge to the Christian God, and as a result, he sought to give toleration and imperial favor to Christianity. He abolished all Roman opposition against Christianity, gave large donations to the church, even exempted Christian clergy from military service. Constantine himself was not baptized until the very end of his life. He said that he wanted to be baptized in the Jordan River, and that's why he was waiting. But in all likelihood, he wanted to live life however he wanted, and then be baptized at the very end, thinking that perhaps his baptism would cover the sins that he had committed previously. This, along with the killing of family members, mainly to uh, solidify his power base, causes one to doubt the authenticity of his Christian profession. He gave his sons a Christian education. His mom, St. Helena, built churches on holy sites in Palestine. He called the Council of Nicaea. He did a lot of really good things, and yet people sometimes wonder, was Constantine truly a believer? A manual of church history says this, he exempted the Christian clergy from military and municipal duties and their property from taxation. He abolished various pagan customs and ordinances offensive to Christians. He facilitated the emancipation of Christian slaves. He legalized bequests to Christian churches. He enjoined the civil observance of Sunday and in connection with an ordinance requiring the consulta consultation of a soothsayer. It's a caveat on his enjoining the civil observance of Sunday. And he contributed largely toward the building of Christian houses of worship and gave his sons a Christian education. So this is, again, a major shift for the emperor of the Roman world to be promoting actively Christianity in all of these ways. But Stephen Tompkins asked the question that we asked earlier, what kind of Christian was Constantine? He ruled with all the bloody brutality of pagan emperors, or Old Testament kings for that matter, killing even his firstborn son to protect his throne. But as well as legalizing Christianity, he Christianized the law. He outlawed crucifixion, the killing of unwanted children, the abuse of slaves and peasants, gladiatorial games and facial branding, and he decreed that all prisoners should see the sun every day. In fact, a lot of the... A lot of Constantine's Christianization of Roman law will show up again in a later Roman emperor named Justinian, and Justinian's law code will become the basis for much Western law, and we see a lot of these Christian principles reflected in our own American legal system. Whether a genuine vision lies behind the Milvian Bridge story or simply inspired PR, there is no doubting the sincerity of Constantine's Christian conversion. Just how Christian it was can be doubted, however. So, there you get a perspective on Constantine. Constantine claimed Christianity. He did much to promote Christianity and to protect Christians. And yet, at the same time, he himself was perhaps not the best example of a sanctified testimony. The results of Constantine's rule. On the positive side, persecution against the church ceased. The church was able to organize church-wide councils, and they were able then to write and to minister in a way in which they did not fear the threat of persecution. Uh, the fourth century of church history is one of the most significant centuries in all of church history. Many of the greatest and most well-known names among the church fathers come out of the fourth century. A lot of that is due to the fact that they were able to minister and to write and to preach openly and without the fear of reprisal. And also their works were preserved unlike the first 300 years of the church where Christian documents were burned and destroyed, after the 4th century, Christian works are preserved and 
utilized, protected by the government. Henry Chadwick says this, the pagan contemporaries of Constantine were not wrong in saying that he had carried through a huge religious and social revolution. To change the religion of the Roman Empire was to change the world. And so the shift now from paganism and from the pantheon of Roman gods to Christianity was in full swing. Yep. Question. Which of the early church fathers had most of an influence on Constantine? I saw Eusebius as the one that baptized him. Would he have been that one, or was there another one? Yeah, probably Eusebius would be viewed as being one of the church fathers who had the closest, one of the closest relationships with Constantine. Um, when we get into, it won't be today, it'll probably be on Tuesday, when we get into all of the intricacies of the Arian versus Trinitarian debate, we'll see that Constantine actually fluctuated quite a bit on that issue, depending on whether he was being influenced by Arians or whether he was being influenced <clears throat> excuse me, by Trinitarians. So, uh, and that also will play a part in our assessment of Constantine's own personal conversion. Constantine doesn't seem to really have cared that much about which way the decision went. It's just that that controversy was threatening the political unity of his empire, so he wanted the church to make a decision so that he could restore unity within his unified Roman Empire because the fear of a doctrinal controversy leading to some sort of political split was something he wanted to avoid. So maybe a matter of convenience for him. So we'll yeah, he seems to have been motivated more out of political expediency than doctrinal conviction. All right, on the negative side, and this did not become full-fledged during Constantine's own lifetime, but looking back over 1,700 years of church history, we have the ability to see the long-term effects of the Christianization of the Roman Empire, or maybe we could flip it around and say the secularization of the Roman church. On the negative side, the connection between church and state soon became inseparable, and nominal Christianity grew as religious freedom for non-Christians became non-existent. So now you have an entire empire in which all of the pagans are forced to become Christians. Hooten says this, The greatest danger threatening Christianity was realized when the emperor decided that he himself would rule the church. The Lord Jesus Christ is the king in his church, and no earthly power should ever be allowed to use its influence, much less its authority in that spiritual dominion where Christ reigns supreme. But Constantine called meetings of bishops and other church dignitaries, and such meetings were then presided over in his name. Now this will become very, very significant in the development of Roman Catholicism. In fact, if we look down a little bit farther, let me find the quote... There it is. All right, so here we are on page 165, and we're going to go back to where we were before. The New Catholic Encyclopedia says, says it this way. Captivated by Christianity, Constantine wanted to give it the protection of the state. For in line with the old Roman idea, and here's the key point, he regarded himself as the Pontifex Maximus, or the high priest, of Christianity bishop in matters external. As such, he thought it his task to settle a controversy that was upsetting the politico-religious unity of his Christian empire. When another synod in Antioch late in 324 failed to affect the desired unity, the emperor himself decided to settle the controversy by a general synod of the more important bishops of the world. But I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that Constantine viewed himself as the head of the church. Constantine saw it as his job to be the high priest of Christianity, which was really a not so much an Old Testament idea as it was a pagan idea that was brought over into the church. 
Constantine then set a precedent for emperors to be viewed as the visible head of the church. You say, well, how does that relate to the Roman Catholic Church? Well, in the western half of the Roman Empire, 150 years later in 476, when the western half of the Roman Empire falls, there will no longer be an emperor in the western half of the Roman world. Rome, the former capital of the empire, is the most important city, but the Roman Empire itself has disintegrated and there is no longer an emperor there. So the bishop of Rome will take on that role of presiding over the Western Church. And in essence, the bishop of Rome will view himself in his religious capacity as the emperor of the Western Church. So Constantine sets that precedent and when emperors no longer exist in the West, the Bishop of Rome takes on that mantle of viewing himself as the Pontifex Maximus of the Church in the West. And we'll get into that a little bit more later, but I just want you to start to see some of these developments taking place as a result of the secularization of the Christian Church. One other negative... Um, implication, and uh, this was a, a while ago, a few months ago, I wrote an article on the Cripplegate blog about what happened during this time period. This is actually a reflection of what John Calvin wrote in his Treatise Against Relics, and I, I believe I've mentioned this in this class before. But I just wanted to read a little bit about this. The question is, when did the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox emphasis on praying to saints and venerating relics and icons begin? A somewhat obscure but extremely helpful book by John Calvin answers that question directly. In his work, A Treatise on Relics, Calvin utilizes his extensive knowledge of church history to demonstrate that prayers to the saints, prayers for the dead, the veneration of relics, the lighting of candles in homage to the saints, and the veneration of icons are all rooted in Roman paganism. Such practices infiltrated the Christian church after Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire in the 4th century. That starts with Constantine. It's officially recognized by Theodosius in 380, but the effects are such that a lot of this superstition that characterized Roman paganism is then Christianized, and eventually it becomes part of the traditional practice of Roman Christianity. So here's an excerpt from Calvin. He says this, Hero worship is innate to human nature, and it is founded on some of our noblest feelings, gratitude, love, and admiration, but which, like all other feelings, when uncontrolled by principle and reason, may easily degenerate into the wildest exaggerations and lead to most dangerous consequences. It was by such an exaggeration that these noble feelings that Roman paganism filled the Olympus with gods and demigods, elevating to this rank men who have often deserved the gratitude of their fellow creatures by some signal services rendered to the community or their admiration by having performed some deeds which required a more than usual degree of mental and physical powers. In other words, Roman paganism elevated the heroes of Roman history to the place of deity. The same cause obtained for the Christian martyrs the gratitude and admiration of their fellow Christians and finally converted them into a kind of demigod. This was more particularly the case when the church began to be corrupted by her compromise with paganism, which, having been baptized without being converted, rapidly introduced into the Christian church not only many of its rites and ceremonies but even its polytheism with this difference that the divinities of Greece and Rome were replaced by Christian saints, many of whom received the offices of their pagan predecessors. So, with the Christianization of Rome, you have a whole bunch of unconverted people who are baptized into the church, and they bring with them all of their superstition and their paganism. They simply Christianize it. The church in the beginning tolerated these abuses as a temporary evil, but was afterwards unable to remove them, and they became so strong, particularly during the prevailing ignorance of the Middle Ages, 
that the church ended up legalizing through her decrees that at which she did nothing but wink at first. So that which was initially just kind of the baggage of Christianizing an empire eventually becomes part of the tradition of both Greek Orthodox and Roman Catholic Christianity. In a footnote, Calvin gives specific examples of how Christian saints simply became substitutes for pagan deities. So St. Anthony restores, like Mercury, stolen property. St. Hubert, like Diana, is the patron of sportsmen. St. Cosmas, like Esculapius, that of physicians, and so on. In fact, almost every profession and trade, as well as every place, have their special patron saint, who, like the tutelary divinity of the pagans, receives particular hours from his or her protégés. So, in the same way that the Roman people honored, prayed to, lit candles for, did homage to their Roman pagan deities, the Christianized paganism of the 5th, 6th, and then Middle Age period begins to do the same thing with Christian saints, biblical saints, and the martyrs of church history. All right, so I just wanted to draw your attention to that. If you're interested in that particular development or in Calvin's take on that development, you can easily find his work online, John Calvin, A Treatise on Relics. It's a pretty fascinating work. He actually quotes very long sections from 16th century Roman Catholic sources in order to prove his point. It's kind of interesting. All right, so going back up then. Uh, the implications of the connection between church and state that begin with Constantine and again are solidified by Theodosius, this will have major implications throughout the entire Middle Ages and will continue to have implications even during the Reformation period. For us in the United States, we take the separation of church and state for granted. In fact, there's a lot of Christians who seem to be trying to undo the wall of separation between church and state. And we'll talk more about that next semester when we get into modern church history. But we take that separation of church and state for granted. It's helpful, I think, and instructive to realize that throughout almost the entirety of church history, there was no separation of church and state. And we'll see that especially when we get to the Reformation period. The Anabaptists argued for a separation of church and state, but the Catholics and the magisterial Protestant reformers did not believe in a separation of church and state. And part of the reason that after Constantine, all the way through the Middle Ages up to the time of the Reformation, part of the reason that heresy was viewed um, and, and responded to and punished so violently is because heresy was equated with treason, because... If there is no separation of church and state, to go against the church is simultaneously to go against the state. And uh, that all starts with Constantine. So we have some important connections that are starting to take place here that will explain things that happen later in church history. All right, after Constantine dies, he is succeeded by his three sons. And in good, humble fashion, he named them all after himself, Constantine II, Constantius II, and Constance. And they jointly rule the empire. When they die, Constantine's nephew comes to the throne, and he actually is the last of the pagan emperors. He only reigned for a couple years, which is why his influence is nothing more than a blip on the screen of Roman history. And yet Julian the Apostate, named the apostate because he tried to take the Roman Empire back in a neo-Platonic pagan direction. And uh, he attempted to undo many of the Christian reforms that Constantine and his sons had put in place, but he only lived for a couple years. And after he died, Valentinian came to the throne 
And after Valentinian, a man named Theodosius, along with Valentinian's sons, Valentinian II and Gratian, reigned. And eventually Theodosius became again the sole ruler of the Roman Empire. Theodosius the Great, or Theodosius I, will be the last sole emperor of the Roman Empire. After Theodosius' death, there will be one emperor in the east and one emperor in the west. A significant footnote that I need to mention here is that Constantine moved his capital city from Rome to Constantinople. And so Constantinople becomes then the new capital city of the Roman Empire. Now, Rome will always stay a significant city. It will always be the capital of the western half of the Roman Empire. And when you have multiple emperors, Rome is the capital in the west and Constantinople is the capital in the east. But Constantinople will become the most powerful city really in the entire world. It will be the most powerful city in the Roman Empire, one of the most beautiful cities ever built. And... Um, Constantinople, of course, still exists today, but we don't call it Constantinople. We call it Istanbul, and it is the capital city of Turkey. It falls in 1456. We'll talk about this more later, but the fall of Rome, the city of Rome in 476, is what marks the beginning of the Middle Ages. The fall of Constantinople in 1456 is what marks the end of the Middle Ages. So the Middle Ages, and not just from a church history perspective, but from a Western civilization perspective, the Middle Ages begin when the Western half of the Roman Empire falls. The Middle Ages end when the Eastern half of the Roman Empire falls. So the Eastern half of the Roman Empire exists until the 15th century before it's finally overrun by Ottoman Turks, and of course today is still under Turkish control. <laughs> All right, Theodosius the Great then, <clears throat> the Council of Nicaea, we're going to go back and talk about more, but the Council of Nicaea was intended to resolve this controversy between Arianism and Trinitarianism, between a denial of the full equality of the second member of the Trinity as being co-equal in his essence with God the Father, that's Arianism, a denial of those things, and Trinitarianism, or an affirmation of his co-equality with the Father. Really, it is the doctrine of the Trinity that is at stake. Nicaea was intended to settle that controversy, but Nicaea didn't end the controversy, even though it made a very decisive ruling. The controversy actually extends for the next 50 years until Theodosius comes to the throne and Theodosius finally and fully puts an end to Arian heresy within the Roman Empire. And so, in 380, on February 27th of 380, Theodosius declares Catholic Christianity. Now again, this is not Roman Catholic yet, not in the way we think of Roman Catholicism. Catholic in the sense of universal, orthodox, historic, Nicene, Trinitarian Christianity to be the only legitimate religion in the Roman Empire. So the Arians will now be persecuted, the Donatists are persecuted, the pagans are persecuted, the mystery religions of Rome, anybody who is not Christian is persecuted. So Ronald Bainton, talking about this period of time, says Julian lasted as emperor only two years. That's Julian the Apostate. The Arian-Athanasian controversy was then resumed until it was definitively resolved by the ascension to the imperial dignity of the Spaniard Theodosius I, who was responsible for the final victory of the Nicene view. We'll be going back through all of this and filling in the details. It was he who summoned the Second Ecumenical Council at Constantinople in 381, where with slight modification the Creed of Nicaea was reaffirmed. Theodosius did much more. He established what even Constantine had never envisioned, the Christian state. Heretics of every sort were forbidden to assemble, and their churches were confiscated. They even lost the right to inherit property. 
As for paganism, once the official religion of the empire, its rituals were proscribed or pre prohibited. Though its adherents were not treated violently or deprived of their civil rights, Half a century later, though, Theodosius II issued the Theodosian Code, which inflicted the death penalty on those who denied the Trinity and on those who repeated baptism, which was a way to attack and persecute the Donatists. So you have persecution of non-Christians now because Christianity has become the official religion of the Roman Empire. This is a dramatic transition. To think of the way in which, for lack of a better term, the fate of Christians has changed within less than 100 years. In the 3rd century, Christianity is persecuted as a threat and as a public enemy of the state. By the end of the 4th century, Christianity has become the official religion of the very empire that tried to stamp it out. Pretty amazing transition. All right, let's talk a little bit about the Council of Nicaea, and this will help to launch our discussion of the Arian and Trinitarian controversy, which we'll look at more in detail on Tuesday. The Council of Nicaea, um, probably more correctly spelled the second way, Nicaea, uh, named after the place where it met, also known as New Constantinople. It was really a suburb of Constantinople, the new capital city of the eastern half of the Roman Empire. The primary controversy at the Council of Nicaea surrounded the nature of Christ. Was he equal with God in his essence, in the essence of his deity, or was he a created being who was not equal with God? To put it into contemporary terms, are the Jehovah's Witnesses right, or are the Trinitarians right? Because Jehovah's Witness theology is essentially a 20th century regurgitation of Arianism. Arianism taught that Jesus Christ was not eternal, this is Frank Little, but made by the Father to do his creative work. In other words, Jesus was the first creature, and then he created other things because God made him first, to be a creator. Some taught that he was elevated to the position of son of God because of his great vir virtue. The teaching appealed to both strict monotheists and to tribesmen who knew all about great men who were elected to become gods. The chief theological champion of what finally became official was Athanasius, who was exiled five times as the tides of political influence and controversy in church synods ebbed away or flowed towards his defense of the true deity of God the Son. Uh, in essence, Arius, who was a presbyter in Alexandria, Egypt, began to question the teachings of the Bishop of Alexandria, a man named Alexander of Alexandria, which I always think is kind of funny that he was name was so close to where he ministered. It'd be like having Fernando of San Fernando. But uh, we have uh, Alexander of Alexandria, who was teaching clearly that uh, Jesus Christ, the Son, was coexistent and co-eternal and therefore co-equal in his character, essence, and being with God the Father. Arius did not approve of this emphasis that his bishop Alexander was promoting, and so Arius began to teach publicly that Alexander was wrong. And uh, eventually, this crisis in Alexandria, Egypt, Resulted in a, it resulted in a synod in Alexandria in 318 where Arius was condemned, but Arianism became such a problem that Constantine himself convened a council in order to bring unity to the Christian church on this issue. Three different positions were put forward at the Council of Nicaea. And you're going to read about all of this. In fact, you already have read about some of this in Stephen Nichols' book, For Us and For Our Salvation. His book is really intended to give supplemental information, detailed information on the Council of Nicaea. Three views. 
heterousius, which means of a different substance. This was the view of Arius, that uh, substance or essence, usius really is better translated, I think, essence, though the Latin word substantia was what was used by the Western Church. And this is where we're going to start to see some of the divisions even between East and West over the issue of language. Heterousius is Greek, means of a different essence. And uh, this then gets translated into Latin as substantia, from which we get our English word substance. This was the view of Arius and uh, some of his friends, Eusebius of Nicomedia, that's not Eusebius of Caesarea, but rather Eusebius of Nicomedia. The heterousius view teaches that Christ, the Logos, is not co-eternal or co-essential or co-equal with God the Father. He was born. So they would see the generation of the Son or the fact that Jesus is begotten as a reference to his birth, such that there was a moment before the creation of the world when the Son of God was begotten. This is a logical position. If the Father begat the Son, he that was begotten had a beginning of existence. And from this it is evident that there was a time when the Son was not. That's a very important phrase there. That's the essence of Arianism. There was when he was not. It's a denial of the co-eternality of the Son of God. It therefore necessarily follows that he had this subsistence from nothing. So here we have the Arian view represented. Jesus Christ is the first created being. He is not equal to God the Father. He is not of the same essence or substance as God the Father. He is not eternal. This view was opposed by Alexander of Alexandria and then also Athanasius, who was a deacon at the time of the Council of Nicaea, but whose work really comes to articulate the Orthodox view. Athanasius taught that there never was a time when he was not. In other words, he is co-eternal and therefore co-equal and co-essential with God the Father. In their character, essence, and being, the Father and the Son are equal. That's the Trinitarian view. And the Holy Spirit is also co-equal in his person, character, and essence. Now there are functional differences, but there, are, there also exists ontological equality. Now, a third view was represented, and we're going to find that this takes place at most of these church councils, that there's view A, and then view B, and then an attempt to find a compromise in the middle. So there's a thesis, and an antithesis, and then a synthesis, if we want to apply Hegelian dialectics to our study of church history. Now, Hegel doesn't come along till much later, but you see the, um, the thesis, antithesis, synthesis model showing up at almost all of these church councils. Homoousius, and this is where Nichols really emphasizes the difference that the letter I can make, or the letter iota in Greek. Here we have only one small change, homoousius, same substance, homoousius of a similar substance, and eventually the Arians, because their heterousius view is soundly condemned, Eventually, the Arians adopt this homoousius view because the Arians find in a similar substance enough ambiguity to fit their heterousius opinions. This view is an attempt to mediate between the two other views. It taught that the Son was divine, but not deity in the sense of being of the same nature as the Father. Eusebius of Caesarea, for example, was one who presented this view because he saw it as a compromise position. In other words, this is ambiguous enough that the people who want to believe same substance and the people who want to believe different substance can all kind of fit somewhere within its boundaries, and, you know, we can all just get along. 
Athanasius and Alexander and others who held to the homoousius view found the homoousius view to be unacceptable because similar does not mean same. Similar still means different. So just because something is similar, that's just another maybe more, um, maybe less radical way of saying different, but it still means different. Similar is not the same. And um, that's a, a significant point. And especially when they saw that the Arians were willing to adopt homoousius gladly and willingly as being um, representative of their views, the Orthodox church leaders absolutely refused to have anything to do with that view. All right, the disputing first led to a council called by Alexander of Alexandria. And we had a hundred bishops from Egypt who met together in 318, and they excommunicated Arius for his false views. So Everett Ferguson tells us that Arius was a Libyan by birth, but received his religious education from Lucian of Antioch. He was already a popular preacher in Alexandria when he challenged his bishop Alexander's teaching that the Father and the Son possess equal eternity. Arius affirmed, there was once when Christ was not. In other words, there was a time when he did not exist. Understanding begetting as equivalent to creating, Arius taught that Jesus Christ was not derived from the substance of the Father, but as the first and highest of God's creations became the instrument of all the rest of creation. Alexander secured a condemnation of Arius' teaching at a synod in Alexandria in 318 that sent a letter to other bishops concerning the exclusion of Arius from fellowship. Arius put his views in writing and appealed to his friends for support, and both sides circulated conflicting correspondence. And so you have then the controversy sparked. Now Arius and his followers actually did some interesting things. For example, they put their theology to music, and uh, and actually put it to some of the popular songs that were sung during that day, and people would uh, would sing songs. Common people would sing songs where they would uh, essentially be affirming Arianism. And so the Orthodox view, even after the Council of Nicaea, Arianism became very popular within the Roman Empire to the point where fights would break out in the streets. People were killed over their views on this issue. It was a major, major issue within the Roman Empire at the time. Mark Knoll says, when in 318 Arius communicated his views to his bishop Alexander, he so stressed the unified eternal character of God the Father that the Son was reduced to a lower status. Arius, who called Alexander a Sabellian, a modalist, for stressing the unity of the Father and the Son, for his part thoroughly subordinated the Son to the Father. In response, many in the church wondered how a subordinated Christ, who was more than human yet less than fully God, could impart salvation to humanity. In other words, wouldn't that destroy the incarnation? And the answer is yes, it would. But to Arius, the transcendence of the Father and the need to pursue logically the meaning of divine unity mattered more than anything else. And I think that's a key point that Noel points out. Arius' view was a logical view. Within the scriptures, there are many places where we have the appearance of paradoxes. They're not really paradoxes, but we have two truths that seem to be contradictory, and yet we know that they are not contradictory. They are harmonious in the mind and wisdom of God. The Trinity is one of those doctrines. On the one hand, Scripture presents the fact that there is only one God. And yet, on the other hand, Scripture also presents the fact that God the Father is God, Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God, they are three independent persons. And so we have these two dual truths. Arius couldn't handle that. And in an attempt to resolve what he saw as a paradox, he elevated one above the other and subordinated the nature of Christ 
to an unbiblical place in the process. He was so committed to his monotheism that it led him to deny the possibility of Trinitarianism. And I think there's a warning for us even in that, that we have to be very careful in our own theological studies not to allow our logic to supersede biblical revelation. Because there are things in Scripture that go beyond the capability of our own human logic to fully understand. Human responsibility and divine sovereignty, both presented in Scripture as true, and yet impossible to logically and fully comprehend with our own limited human ability, it's not certainly impossible in the perfect wisdom and mind of God. The Trinity is one of those same doctrines. And so Arius allowed his logic to run away with him, and as a result, he really becomes uh, one of history's most notorious heretics. All right, more disputing caused Emperor Constantine to call a major council in Nicaea. And uh, according to Eusebius of Caesarea, there were 318 bishops who came from all around the Roman Empire and some also who came from outside of the Roman Empire, from the Parthian Empire who came uh, from modern-day Assyria, the Assyrian church who attended as well. Uh, We don't know for sure whether or not this is an actual number, if there were actually 318 bishops who were there. Some scholars think that Eusebius chose a number that he believed had allegorical significance based on a passage in Genesis where Abraham took 318 servants and went and and, um, I think he rescued Lot from being kidnapped uh, in that passage. But it's a passage in Genesis where Abraham has 318 servants and there is some thought that perhaps that's where Eusebius got his number. I don't know why that would be significant, but in any case, uh, scholars are not entirely sure that it was exactly 318 bishops who came to the Council of Nicaea. In any case, if you include the presbyters and deacons who came with them, we probably have over 2,000 church leaders who assemble at the Council of Nicaea. was the number of bishops that showed up with that? Was that one bishop per church in, in the empire? Uh, no, this would be the leading bishops. So uh, not necessarily every single bishop represented. There were probably more churches than this, but this would be the leading, most influential bishops who were invited, summoned by Constantine himself to appear because this issue had gotten to the point where Constantine said, for the sake of the political unity within the Roman Empire, we have to get this religious dispute resolved. I mean, I think it's hard for us to even appreciate how big a deal this became. I mean, we're in the middle of a political season right now where there's a lot of arguing and debating that goes on between people of differing political viewpoints. But the Arian-Athanasian controversy, both before and especially after the Council of Nicaea, reached levels that even our own political fervor doesn't reach in this country. I mean, it was, it was a, a divisive political issue. Uh, so we have these bishops gathering. Mark Knoll says about 320 bishops. It's the first worldwide council to adjudicate the meaning of Jesus' divinity dealt with an issue at the very heart of the Christian faith. Now, a couple things about what happened at the Council of Nicaea. First, it's important to note that the position of Arius, and we're talking about the heterousius position, that position was immediately rejected by the Council. So these bishops come together, And I think it's important for us to understand that the job these bishops had was not to establish doctrine. The job these bishops had was to confirm and affirm the doctrine that they had always understood the church to have believed going back to the time of the apostles. 
So Nicaea doesn't establish the doctrine of the Trinity. Nicaea affirms the doctrine that had always been understood as being true from the very beginning. So these 320 bishops come together and their job is to assess what is it that the Christian church has always believed going back to the time of the apostles. Arius' view is immediately rejected. But a compromise view is put forth. And that compromise view is put forth by Eusebius of Caesarea. And this compromise view is the homoiousius. So the homoiousius view, we add in that iota, and we say, well, okay, maybe not the same substance, maybe just a similar substance. And uh, Eusebius essentially puts this forward as something that is ambiguous enough to kind of include everybody. But it became obvious that the compromise position would not pass. Homoousius supporters insisted that that was the right apostolic biblical understanding of the nature of Christ. And so Constantine approved the Nicene Creed. And of the 318 bishops who were there, 316 of them approve, affirm, and I'm not sure if they actually signed anything, but they affirm the Nicene Creed. So you have, of the 318 bishops, all but two who affirm that, yes, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, being the same substance as the Father, co-eternal with the Father, is representative of what the church has always believed from the time of the apostles. The two who did not sign were both supporters of Arius. Arius was not a bishop, so he didn't get a say, but Eusebius of Nicomedia and one other Arian bishop are the only two who refused not to participate. Now that's significant. Uh, the uh, where did I have it up here? I have a lecture that I used to that I've done before. I, I don't do it anymore because the Da Vinci Code is now passe. 2006 is too long ago to talk about anymore. But in the Da Vinci Code, written by uh, Brown, we have a character, Dan Brown. We have a character named Sir Teabing who represents kind of the main skeptic. And through the dialogue and words of this character, Dan Brown essentially attempts to crack what he thinks are or, uh, holes in the uh, traditional Christian understanding of the nature of Christ and really a whole set of basic Christian doctrines. One of those is the Trinity. So one of the claims that the Da Vinci Code makes about Christianity is that Jesus' deity was invented by Constantine in the 4th century. This is comes straight out of the book. So we have Sir Teabing, this character, who says things like this, Almost everything our fathers taught us about Christ is false. Jesus was, quote, a mortal prophet, a great and powerful man, but a man nonetheless, a mortal. Constantine upgraded Jesus' status almost four centuries after Jesus' death. Jesus' establishment as the Son of God was officially proposed and voted on by the Council of Nicaea, a relatively close vote at that. Many scholars claim that the early church literally stole Jesus from his original followers, hijacking his human message, shrouding it in an impenetrable cloak of divinity. And uh, so I, I just read those quotes to you. I think even um, Stephen Nichols mentioned some about the Da Vinci Code in his For Us and For Our Salvation. It's just such an explicit attack on the deity of Christ and such a overt example of bad history that it serves our purpose as well in this class. Because when we actually look at the Council of Nicaea and what happened, a couple things. Number one, Constantine didn't care what decision was made. He just wanted a decision made. Number two, the bishops who were there 
didn't determine the Trinity. They were affirming what it was that they understood historic Christianity to always have taught. And number three, it was not a relatively close vote. It was everybody, except for two diehard supporters of Arius, everybody affirmed this is the way in which we have understood the nature of Christ. He is of the same substance as the Father. So I think it's helpful for us to get our facts straight when it comes to understanding the Council of Nicaea. Now, the Nicene Creed says Arianism is wrong, but Arianism didn't go away for the next 50 years in the Roman Empire. It continued to wreak havoc until finally Theodosius came along and, and sealed the lid on Arianism. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on in this class. The council adopted the Nicene Creed with its short but direct statement of the deity of Christ. And uh, it did lack some precision. When we get to the Council of Constantinople in 381, they will revise the Nicene Creed just slightly by adding in material about the Holy Spirit to make sure... In the Nicene Creed, it just says, and we believe in the Holy Spirit. In the niceno constantinopolitan Creed, which is the expanded version, we have an affirmation of the full equality and eternality of the person of the Holy Spirit, just as we do with the person of the Son in the Nicene Creed. Yep? Uh, going back to, the, uh, to Dan Brown, I've found that a lot of cults uh, have adopted his, his view. Can you talk about any other false religions that has picked it up outside of Arianism? who uses uh, that excuse that the deity of Christ was picked up at the Council of Nicaea as the launch pad for their particular belief. Well, there certainly are a number of cults and false religions that deny the deity of Christ. And the modern day Watchtower Society would be the closest representation and reflection of 4th and 5th century Arianism. Uh, but you even have in cult groups like Mormonism a denial of the deity of Christ. And in Dan Brown's case with the Da Vinci Code, he's not advocating watchtower theology. He's advocating really a return to paganism and um, and he's doing so by arguing that the Gnostics were the ones who really had they were the ones who really understood who Jesus was. And Constantine uh, is the one who messed it all up. But the problem with that is when you actually go back and look at when the biblical gospels were written and affirmed by true Christians throughout that early period, as opposed to the Gnostic gospels, which were all written later and which were all universally condemned by true Christians far before the Council of Nicaea, it quickly becomes obvious that Dan Brown has no idea what he's talking about. Um, and and I, I have that full PowerPoint there. I mean, that was just one small part of it. If you actually examine the Da Vinci Code, there is nothing, there is nothing in that book that is true. I mean, almost nothing. Um, it's actually kind of funny because the book begins with what it calls a fact page. And the fact page is completely false. So the only actual factual information in the book is in the copyright page where it says everything in this book is a work of fiction. And so if you start there and you understand the rest of the story as that, um, and I, you know what, honestly, I don't think Dan Brown cares because Dan Brown made millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. But um, at the same time, he's not off the hook. I think there is massive accountability waiting for him because of the way in which that book shipwrecked the faith of a lot of people. But there's nothing in that book that's true. Nothing. I mean, even his, I mean, he's got all sorts of stuff about even modern day geographical locations that's false. So it's not just church history stuff that's false. The whole thing is a fabrication. Um, all right. So the Nicene Creed, 
And here you can see we believe in one God, the Almighty Maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten of His Father, of the substance of God, or of the essence of God, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made. So we're going to understand begotten now, not in the sense of creation, but in the sense of uniqueness. That he is the only begotten son means he is the unique son of God. And he is different than uh, those whom he came to save who become the adopted children of God. We see that in Romans 8, 17 and 18. But Jesus Christ is the unique son of God because he shares the father's essence. Being of one substance. And here you have homoousius, consubstantialum with the Father, by whom all things were made. And uh, it goes on from there. And it says, a little bit farther down, whoever shall say that there was a time when the Son of God was not, that's the key statement out of Arianism, or that before he was begotten he was not, or that he was made of things that were not, or that he is of a different substance or essence from the Father, or that he is a creature or subject to change or conversion, all who say that, the universal and apostolic church anathematizes them. And we start to have now creeds and councils that excommunicate people on the basis of false doctrine. Um, one other statement in there, by whom, in the middle, by whom all things were made, both which be in heaven and in earth, who for us men and for our salvation came down and was made incarnate and made a man, was incarnate and was made a man. Uh, that's the sentence from which Stephen Nichols derives the title for his book. So the title for that book comes straight out of the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed affirms that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is co-eternal with the Father, co-essential, that they share the same essence, ontologically, uh, that they are equal, even if functionally they are distinct. And this flew in the face of the false teachings of Arius. Gino, final question before we dismiss. Yeah, the common denominator in cults today is the denial of um, the Trinity, um, and with the, with Arius, and they also the correlation is that uh, they don't uphold sola fide, or they uphold a works based salvation. Did Arius uphold a works based salvation, or was did he uphold sola fide? Do you know? You know, that's a good question. I don't know specifically what his soteriology was. The controversy that surrounded him with regard to his Christological views was so big and massive that really the only thing we remember him in church history for is his denial of really the full deity of Jesus Christ. But you're right with regard to cult groups. Cult groups have... I see there being three criteria by which we judge a group as being a cult group or even an apostate group. They have a wrong view of God in terms of his essential character and essence. So a denial of the Trinity would certainly fit that category. They have a wrong view of salvation and the gospel. And they have a wrong view of the scriptures. And we see that, for example, in the Jehovah's Witnesses. They deny the deity of Christ. That's a wrong view of God. They teach salvation by works, essentially. You have to be a good Jehovah's Witness to go to heaven or now to, to live on the new earth since the new Jerusalem's filled up. And, uh, and they have a wrong view of the scriptures because they allow the scriptures to be dominated and misinterpreted by the teachings of the Watchtower Society. They put the teachings of the Watchtower Society as a higher authority over scripture itself. The Jehovah's Witnesses um, also are a group that are characterized by um, false prophecy. And that's something that if you ever study the history of the movement, they have predicted the end of the world probably a dozen times and been wrong every time. So that's another clue that you're not part of a true religion.